One day, I was asked to come speak and give a public lecture here at this university, and it was on innovations and technologies. And as I was walking through the university being given a tour, I actually met a few medical students sitting under a tree, and, uh, and the remarkable feature was when I met them, they were actually teaching themselves biochemistry using sticks in the dirt. My name is Chol Makur Achek. I'm a medical student, Juba University, fifth year. Now the students that I met had been struggling for anywhere from one to three years here with essentially no instructors. And they described that evening that I first met them, that they had one cadaver, a teacher, one teacher only that taught a third of the time. They had six books, no microscopes, no laboratory, and uh, essentially no classrooms. So I found that remarkable and got to know them over the next few days. And in a sense, when I went back to Boston, I, I couldn't let go of the story and told several people. And, and uh, three Harvard medical students said, send me, just send me. When I was still a young boy, I didn't know whether there is something called read and write. So I didn't know the world was big, so that there, there are doctors in, there are pilots, there are engineers. It's when I got to school, that's when I got to learn that there are other people in the world, and there is some kind of health care in the world. So I was just in the bush, I was born during the war, I, and I didn't see any doctor, so that I say this, is, this should be my role model. I started at admiring being a doctor when I had malaria. I saw doctors in WOW, so I recovered from it, and I said this could be a good thing to do, so that I help other people like the way they have helped me now. So I was a fourth year medical student at Harvard Medical School when I volunteered to go to Juba to do some work in, at the medical school as a teacher, as a medical student representing the American universities. I was there by myself for two weeks and then with one other person for the remainder of the four weeks. There was no curriculum, there were no objectives, there were no goals, um, there was very little supervision, um, but yet myself and the other, the other student, we were able to make something of it just based on what we felt the students should learn. And that sort of cobbling together this curriculum from essentially uh, just bits and pieces from all over the place were, was probably one of my most proudest accomplishments uh, when I was there. When it comes to being a physician, you're often faced with the same situation where you are expected to be the problem solver with what you have with very little supervision, um, particularly as a young doctor because that is how we learn. That is why we spend so many hours in the hospitals, so that we're exposed to every situation, we think through it on our own, and we become better doctors for it. When I really, really knew that I wanted to be a doctor is uh, when I was in my primary six, and I was in one of the neighboring countries, South Sudan, during the, the war time. My school, my primary school was near a hospital, where there was a female Australian doctor. And I thought only doctors can only be males. But when I saw her, I knew I can also be a doctor and I very much wanted to be a doctor because if 
everybody wants me to help. If everybody looks up to you for help and you're so resourceful, that's the most important thing. I think everybody in this world seeks to leave a legacy behind. And for me, that was a legacy. She never noticed that she influenced me, she inspired me, but I knew then, back then, that I really wanted to be a doctor. Those medical students knew that they were not there just to learn medicine, but that they were forming a foundation for their entire country. So they never lost track of the fact of that they were the first class of physicians in 30 years in a war-torn nation. They never lost track of the fact and were in fact quick to remind me on many occasions of what the maternal mortality, mortality statistics were in southern Sudan, uh, the infant mortality statistics, some of the worst in the world. They know what's going on and they know that they can do something about it because these students are going to be the leaders of the future in the government. Now, over a year later, we've actually created an arc of education where this past year we had 12 instructors coming from different medical schools in the United States and also the University of Nairobi. We have a detailed curriculum. We have these two classrooms. They're woefully undersized. We've now gone from six books to this is a little mini library, which is, constitutes just a wall. We then were able to get Massachusetts General Hospital to uh, donate a large number of microscopes that now are the mainstay of their education for microscopic anatomy. In the United States and in other countries, this intellectual property of slide sets and educational materials are very carefully protected. So, for example, these all these slides were donated to us from Albany Medical College, but it's not usually a college or university that does it, but it's some heroic individual. You know, I have been sent here and I take it very seriously that this is my job to teach them this material. And if, if they don't learn it, I take that as my fault. The most valuable part of the experience is definitely the interaction with the student. I told them that because of the time constraints and the fact that I have to go back to the States and, and graduate and all that, we're going to have to finish neurophysiology in about eight days. And normally I think we would have been taught for maybe three weeks in the U.S. These students, their dedication and their commitment to purpose is something that I've never witnessed in my life. Some of them child soldiers. Uh, uh, some of them uh, living lives, or all of them living lives, that we can't even imagine. There are many ways in which many children went into becoming a child soldier. So one of the ways I went into was they gave some kind of motivation. Like they can say, so we need your son for schooling. They can even take advantage of those children whose parents died in the war. So these children were taken to a camp. So in this camp they were trained some basic uh, training for a soldier. And uh, of course they gave some education. They could teach children how to read and write. But then if they, if they saw a child who has grown strong, with, with enough age to be recruited to become a soldier, they could take that child. It is because of the war. The Sudanese conflict displaced millions of people. I'm one of those. So I lost my brother to a disease that I later came to discover was very simple, pneumonia. It was uh, during uh, the 1993 rainy season. So we were relaxed that afternoon. He fell sick overnight. And uh, the following day, he was not very well. Then the following night, he passed away. So that was really terrible. I couldn't understand that he was dead, but after some weeks, I came to realize that uh, he had died and it was really unimaginable. In a very large village, say big town, there's only one clinic or primary health care unit and the whole community is dependent on that. At times people were reluctant to get medical facilities and uh, you could bear the disease until you are well. So that gave me the courage that why don't I study medicine and get to help those who are helping now. Uh, given the, the time that we are now independent country, I think uh, one of the challenge, the focus was the war. Now the war is gone. I think we all need to put up our minds together and think of how do we develop this country now.
the development needs of southern Sudan are absolutely mind-boggling. I, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Somalia in the 1960s. And I must tell you that Somalia in the 1960s had better infrastructure than southern Sudan has today. Just two and a half weeks ago, a few of the South Sudan medical students essentially carried one of their own um, comrades into our small house. And he was confused, uh, thin as could be, and uh, clearly starving. We discovered that Luke wasn't alone, and we immediately swung into action and started something called the South Sudan Emergency Relief Fund. In College of Medicine, uh, we had enough materials when we were in Khartoum, but when the university was relocated, those materials remain in the north. Yeah, the current challenge in South Sudan regarding the medical students and medical education is really uh, dynamic and it seems to be changing moment to moment. We had been told that we could start medical school and in the last 72 hours we've been told essentially that uh, the training won't be able to start and in fact it's really unclear when or if or how it would ever begin. If we don't begin medical school soon two things will happen. One is our own trajectory of inspiration and growing will be severely disrupted and probably collapse. Two is the medical students, they somehow thought that independence would mean that immediately their own country leadership would provide for them and that opportunity would grow, not collapse. I do think about throwing my hands up and quitting, but what keeps my hands at my side are the people, the students. Well. What else can I say? It's all have to do with, it has to do with uh, the patience. We can't say things should happen overnight. But well, being in medical school has taught me to endure and always to hope for the better. Things sometimes make one lose so much hope and you really start doubting, am I really going to be a physician someday? But sometimes when we have people visiting like this, come help us, show us how to do clinical examinations, that's, that's, that's quite encouraging, yeah. So it's quite, quite a challenge situation and it is durable. So we can leave it and we need a lot of work. We need a lot of work in the field of education. We need a lot of work in the field of health care. We need a lot of work in many sectors of economy. Like now we have come out, South Sudan is a country where there are 15% of educated people. So it is up to us to work for prosperity. Therefore we need, we need support from uh, governments, from institutions and so on to help us with training, to help us with the equipment, uh, to help us with the development of the infrastructure. One of the breakthroughs in, in being able to um, support medical education in South Sudan has been that the CEO of Juba Teaching Hospital and the Undersecretary in the Ministry of Health has asked us to take on a portion of the Juba Teaching Hospital as our own and as a domain that's really focused on education. Why I'm here in Juba, South Sudan, boy, I'm trying to figure that out. I'm a specialist in emergency medicine. And we're trying to improve the lot of the medical students who've basically been ousted from their medical school. One of the big things we're going to try to do is try to start a primary teaching service and actually as a model but also as a way for the students to be learning some of the basic medical practice. I came out here with my wife Heidi uh, at the beginning of this year, just over five months ago now, to um, volunteer at Juba Teaching Hospital and work on the wards but also deliver medical education. We've done percussion, auscultation, well done. All right, so do you want to finish up? You've got your stethoscope. It is, it's a meaningful assistance. Because these are people who have nothing. And whatever little you give means so much. Well, I am an internal medicine physician. I finished my residency in 2010, um, did a, a chief year uh, at Georgetown University Hospital in DC. 
and I had planned on taking this year off uh, to volunteer abroad. Um, I've sort of imagined since college of, of coming and being able to use my skill to, to sort of make a difference. We are, are trying to, to educate the students, primarily uh, at the bedside, doing clinical rounds in the hospital, and currently that's two or three times a week. The other half is, uh, is really a sort of a, a didactic course. We are uh, having lecture three times a week, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday afternoon, uh, just doing an introduction to clinical medicine. The, the original intention was to offer the course to the fifth and sixth years because it's really more clinically based. And we had no idea how many students would sign up for the course. I think the thought was maybe 30 or 40 students. We opened the list and all of the medical students came in and we had over 200 students sign up. So it's really hard when you see that level of enthusiasm to turn students away. So we ended up doing a second class for the second through fourth year students. So I think a lot of the, the obstacles are sort of they have to keep their lives going, um, but are not officially students, but yet aren't really working uh, because they're, they're waiting for school to start. So they're in a bit of limbo. So in 2010, we actually did some analysis at the end of the year and discovered that we had taught over 1,500 hours. We had delivered full courses in physiology, biochemistry, anatomy, histology, and by the end of uh, 2010, there were examinations for the students, and, uh, and a remarkable number of the students passed formal examinations that were administered by the UK, so international standards, and uh, it was very exciting for everybody. So the question comes up often about sustainability of our activities, and, uh, and Actually, I, I don't want us to be sustainable in the traditional sense. I want us to be obsolete. Um, and, uh, and I think the horizon is probably somewhere around 10 years. And over that 10 years, we would like to train enough nurses, medical students, doctors, so that we're not necessary anymore. It was gratifying to, to all of us on July the 9th once the independence of, uh, of South Sudan was declared and the flags of South Sudan were put up on, on poles around, the one empty flagpole across the street saw the flag of South Sudan being raised and next to it was the flag of the United States. I think that is a symbolic explanation of the relationship between the people of South Sudan and the people of the United States. They know that we walk with them through those years of struggle. They also know that we're going to be walking with them into the future. A future, quite frankly, that I think is bright. And there's hope that, uh, you know, with the passage of the referendum and and by and large, despite what everybody sees in the media, sort of on the fringes of the country, the bulk of the country has remained stable and peaceful, and, uh, and that's, that's the real story. If things all go well, even after whatever period of time, I'll be very happy to be among the first doctors to graduate in this new country. There are difficulties here and there, but I have faith that our government, other stakeholders, and those who recognized us as an independent nation will always work hand in hand and try to see that we also become not just independence by raising a flag, but independence that starts from an individual like me if I graduate out of medical school. That's, that's, that's really independence achieved to a greater extent than just raising a flag. Oh, I'm going